You know, listening to podcasts is awfully like drinking a pint. Having one is fine, but it's more fun to have a second. Hi, this is Andrew from the podcast Pop Culture Brews, and you are listening to Homebrewing DIY. After this episode, why don't you come and join me and my co-host Tyler as we do deep dives on pieces of pop culture we absolutely love, and then at the end of our episodes, we reveal to you the beer we were inspired to brew by it. You can find us on Apple Podcasts, Stitcher, Spotify, anywhere really where you get your podcasts. So why don't you come and join us and have a pint? The history of beer is something that's always really fascinated me. You may have noticed in the last few episodes, peppered within, we've had an author or two talking about the history of beer. Well, today we have another author. His name's Peter Simons, and he's written a few books, Guile Brews, Six O'Clock Brews, and Bronzed Brews. And we're going to dive into the history of Australian beer today on Homebrewing DIY. Keeping a clean brewery is the key to making great beer that doesn't get contaminated. Do you use a glass or plastic carboy for your fermentation? Did you know that getting your carboy clean can be tough, especially removing the crucin ring? Even with traditional carboy cleaning tools, it can take a lot of time and not get your carboy completely clean. Well, today there's a new tool that can easily clean your carboy and do it fast. And that tool is called a scrubber ducky. Scrubber duckies are a new magnetic carboy cleaner that are easy to use and get the cleaning results required in brewing. Drop a magnetic scrubber into your carboy and be able to scrub away all of the grime in that hard to clean cruisin. They are no match for scrubber duckies. And you can get yours today at scrubberduckies.com. Once again, head over to scrubberduckies.com. Building recipes and taking good notes are two of the key fundamentals of making great beer. This is one of the first things that you learn when becoming a new brewer. I started taking notes on a sheet from my extract kit and then quickly moved to brewing software. I've tried many different types of brewing software and then I found Brewfather. This is the one piece of software that you need for recipes and very detailed brew day notes as well as fermentation notes. Brewfather also integrates with some of the topics that we discuss on the show like the till hydrometer, the ice spindle, and ferment track. You need no other piece of software than Brewfather. One of the best parts of Brewfather is that you can try it for free. All you need to do is head to our website, homebrewingdiy.beer, and click on the Brewfather banner to sign up for free today. Once again, that's homebrewingdiy.beer, and sign up for Brewfather today. Have you ever wanted to make a podcast? Do you have a subject you want to discuss with listeners? Do you even know where to start? Well, if you want to make a podcast and you want to get started now, I could not recommend Anchor enough. Anchor is the easiest way to make a podcast. Anchor gives you everything you need in one place for free, which you can use right from your phone or computer. Creation tools allow you to record and edit your podcast so it sounds great. They'll distribute your podcast for you so it can be heard everywhere. Spotify, Apple Podcasts, Google Podcasts, and many more. And you can easily make money from your podcast with no minimum listenership. Hey, look. I shopped around for a place to post my podcast, and Anchor was the easiest, most streamlined experience you could ask for. So if you're looking for a place for your new podcast, download the Anchor app or go to anchor.fm to get started. Once again, download the Anchor app or go to anchor.fm to get started. 
and welcome back to Homebrewing DIY, the podcast that takes on the do-it-yourself aspect of homebrewing. Gadgets, contraptions, and parts, this podcast covers it all. Today on the show, we're talking to Peter Simons, author of his newest book, Guile Brews. He's also written a book called Six O'Clock Brews and Bronze Brews. We're also going to dive a bit deeper into his book called Guile Brews and revisit the Cornish beers of his youth. It's going to be an exciting show, so stick around. But first, I'd like to thank our patrons. It's because of your support that this show can come to you week after week. Head over to patreon.com forward slash homebrewing DIY and give at any amount. We are currently still doing the offer where if you give it $1, you get access to our ad-free RSS feed as well as early released episodes. We'll also send you a homebrewing DIY sticker. Head over there. It's a $5 value, so it's totally worth it. Also, if you do give it the $5 level today, we're going to send you a free gift from our sponsor, Scrubber Duckies. I've sent out a few, and uh, I've got some feedback from Ian, who is also a $5 contributor on our patrons. And he actually sent me a note this week saying that he received his Scrubber Ducky and that he was really excited to use it and surprised by the quality. I I have to admit that when I used it, I felt the same way. So head over to patreon.com forward slash homebrewing DIY today. Another way to support the show is always by giving us a review. If you head over to Apple Podcasts or podchaser.com, you could give us a review and your review is going to help other homebrewers find the show. The last way that you can support the show is to head over to our website, homebrewingdiy.beer, and use some of our sponsor leaks. There you'll find a sponsor leak for Brewfather and Adventures in Homebrewing. You click on the link, the prices stay the same, but it lets them know that we sent you and they support the show in turn. So please head on over to homebrewingdiy.beer and support us today. Well, this week I finally started drinking my Irish red ale that I made with uh, my boss back a few weeks ago. Uh, it's all kegged up and ready to go. It tastes great, actually. Uh, surprisingly, after all of the problems I had with this 20-gallon batch, it, I felt like it was just one thing after another that just kept going wrong with it. Uh, but in the end, despite myself, uh, somehow I still made a pretty good beer. So drinking it today and uh, tastes great. Also this weekend, I'm pretty excited to try out a new England IPA recipe, uh, a tweak to my last one, uh, added a little bit more oats and decided to do 100% Pilsner as the base malt, and then we're going to do Galaxy and Amarillo for the hopping. So very heavy, dry hop on the ends, on the backside, and we're also going to do very, very few bittering hops. But uh, yeah, we'll, we'll see how it all goes. I'm pretty excited to see how this beer is going to turn out. So now let's just dive into today's show. We're going to talk to Peter Simons a little bit more about some beer history as we dive into the history of Australian beers and as well as his newest book, Guile Brews. I'd like to welcome Peter Simons. He's a well-known author in the brewing world. He's brewed such books as Bronze Brew, Six O'Clock Brews, and his newest book, Guile Brews, and I'd like to welcome to Homebrewing DIY. Hi, how are you going? Well, well, welcome to the show, and I think the first place we'll we'll start with our conversation today would be, let's let's talk a bit about your first book and Bronze Brews, and, and really how you started writing about beer and how you put out that book. Okay, um... Well, I've been I've been brewing for over uh, over twenty years, and um, we had a uh, a conference in Melbourne modelled on the uh, uh, NHC, uh, which is now HomebrewCon, and the first one of those um, uh, conferences was held in Melbourne in two thousand and eight, um, and the a couple of the stars that uh, were uh, brought down from America were uh, John Palmer and Jamil Zainashev. And uh, we got to hang out with them a bit and drank a few beers, and as you do. And um, Jamil was doing the Brewing with Style show on the Brewing Network, and he asked me at very short notice if I could talk about Australian sparkling ale. Well, 
I'd like to make sure I've got my facts organised. So I went to the, um, the State Library in Sydney and started looking for appropriate books so that I could get some, some context to, um, uh, to the style. And then I did the podcast and it sort of set off something in me to go and look for other historical beers. I've always been a fan of um, Ron Pattinson's Shut Up About Barclay Perkins blog uh, and he had a lot of Let's Brew Wednesday historic, mainly UK, but a few other uh, beer recipes. So I... I started looking about for where I could find more information uh, about historic Australian beer. Now, there's lots of brewing histories. Uh, This is across the whole world. But they're usually the founding of the brewery, uh, when they've been bought by another brewery, uh, perhaps being taken over by a larger predator, then the closure of the founding brewery, and then a loss of the beers that were being produced. And what went on in the 19th and 20th centuries is repeated in the craft beer, craft beer industry in, in this century. Uh, most of these histories were, were all about people, dynasties, a little bit of contemporary events. They might talk a little bit about the brewery, its architecture. Might be a bit about the plant used for brewing, but usually nothing about the actual beer. Uh, They might put a few label descriptions in, but but they weren't really helping me uh, get to the goal of recreating some historic beers. So with Bronze Brews and the subsequent books, I've taken a, a brewing centric approach. I've I've used the historical context pretty much as as a contemporary brewing brewery description adverts with illustrations. Uh, there's there's a really big um, newspaper archive in Australia called Trove, which is a free. Uh, a free uh, website and I highly recommend it if you if you're interested in um, in searching through old newspapers Uh, and because you can search on it and you can get a lot of background information so with all that information from the web I still did not have any actual historic recipes so Initially, I went to the Powerhouse Museum in in Sydney. Uh, I contacted one of the curators and he said, yes, we've got some books. So I went along and I took my camera with me. And this is back in probably 2010 and photographed away. I had no idea what I was looking at. I just photographed everything that was available. And then when I went home, I started uh, to analyze what it was that I had. Uh, What I had ended up with was uh, Tooth & Company 1844 XXX and Porter Recipe. Uh, And that was really one of the very earliest um, beers that I've ever ever found a a primary record because these these records are um, uh, the original notes just like you would keep notes uh, today with uh, brew father with what you've what you've um, brewed for the day uh, and other brewing records this is what people noted down when they're actually brewing the beer they're not necessarily recipes they're production records so that it does require a level of uh, interpretation shall we say yeah, if somebody's got a brew note like for my like I would use for my own personal brewing, especially my kind of handwritten jotted down notes, it might be things like mash temperature. It's not going to be as detailed maybe with the ingredients I used uh or wor- was it? What 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 kind of what kind of 
things were in those notes that uh, helped you kind of get to a recipe? Well, it, if you're lucky, you get um, uh, you get the materials used, uh, and for a, a, a 19th century Australian beer, you're talking. The easy bit is uh, up to 30% of uh, sugar, which is probably a raw sugar, demerara type sugar. Uh, and then you've got some malt, and the malt uh, uh, would have come from either from the UK in tanks, uh, an early form of um, containerization, if you like. Uh, what state it was in when it had travelled, you know, halfway around the world? Uh, for brewing is is an open question. It did take <laughs> quite a while before they um, uh, they had developed enough of an uh, agricultural industry to grow barley. But later on in the eight, in the in the nineteenth century, they they were definitely using domestic barley. So you you you've got a uh, a malt and you've got sugar. So seventy percent malt. Um, now that malt was probably fairly, fairly ropey. Uh, probably wasn't very well modified. So you've got, you've typically got those, those things. You you would have hops listed as as so many pounds of hops. Uh, very rare do you get um, the actual addition times. Uh, you might have the boil, um, boil time. Uh, and if you're lucky, you get a gravity. Now, gravities in the period we're talking about are in pounds per barrel. And pounds per barrel is uh, can be converted into specific gravity. Uh, the barrel we're talking about isn't a U.S. barrel. It's an imperial barrel of 36 gallons. So with that information, you get the original gravity. Sometimes they will list the uh, final gravity, which may not actually be the final gravity. It might be that it was the racking gravity uh, and may not take into account priming and, and, and things like that. But within those sort of um, those constraints and conversion of archaic uh, measurements like quarters, uh, in the UK, uh, a quarter is typically 336 pounds of base malt. Other malts were different weights, but that's unless you've got something in the log that actually overrides that, that's not a bad, bad default. In Australia, a quarter was 320 pounds. So it does affect the percentages of the grist and, and the, the percentages... Uh, what I use to base the the recipe on. Uh, you mentioned mashing. Uh, mashing, usually some mashing temperatures were in there. Uh, and if you've got a big enough spread, say over um, five or six brews over a number of months, you can definitely work out a a pattern and 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 get to an approximation of what what they were actually shooting for in the way of a recipe. Oh, cool. So so you it's almost the way I would kind of put it in modern terms is you're kind of looking at the metadata and if you get enough of it you can kind of put together what they were actually doing based on having enough of that kind of almost almost a not the, the full picture but get enough partial pictures you can put together a full picture i guess that would be the way yeah yeah um uh, there's a level of in interpretation required uh and when i started out i was working on a baseline of having nothing to compare anything else to uh over the last eight nine ten years uh, i've now seen literally thousands of brewing records and you you can pick patterns so i mean metadata pattern uh patterning uh that type of thing you you get a feel for what it was yeah yeah, yeah. that's that. so so your first one was 
in search for the Australian sparkling pale ale. What does could you describe that beer and and maybe ex- explain to somebody here in the states that's maybe never had one what, what that beer is like? Yeah, well, actually, the whilst the first book was inspired by uh, uh, talking about Australian sparkling, uh, Australian sparkling is is really uh, a single product now from Cooper's Brewery in in Adelaide, and in my so it was a notable exception from the first book. The second book, Six O'Clock Brews, uh, I was again at a um, homebrew uh, conference in, a, in Adelaide, and Dr. Tim Cooper was the, uh, one of the guest speakers. So I had a copy of Bronze Brews in my, in my hot little hand, and I went up after he'd, um, he'd said his piece, I got in the queue of all the people that were there and I asked him very nicely if I could look at his archives. And some months later, he actually, uh, uh, we managed to arrange it and he gave me an office and brought out the original brewing books out of the company safe uh, from 1862. Uh, and I was permitted to uh, photograph and copy and do whatever I needed to do. So I ended up with about 100 years of how uh, Cooper's Ale, Cooper's Sparkling uh, had developed. And that formed uh, the backbone, if you like, of the, of the second book. Now, to answer your question about Sparkling Ale, uh, really it wasn't that romantic when Sparkling Ale was uh, introduced. Mostly it was just bottled whatever draft beer they had at the beginning of the uh, 20th century. So it, it wasn't particularly special. What it, what it did, and, and this is one of, the, one of the problems about simplification and generalization. Uh, every beer is a product of its time and its particular circumstances. And that beer may well have stayed the same for 10, 20, 30 years. And then there was some event like World War I or World War II or depression or taxation, and the beer changed. Uh, to a lesser extent, the, uh, the materials used in creating the beer, the, the hop type stayed consistent for long periods of time. So to generalise about Cooper's Sparkling Ale, which you can get today, is not the same as uh, from, say, uh, the 1970s, the 1950s, the 1930s, or turn of the 20th century. So it's very difficult to, to say what it is. And at the uh, homebrewing conference two years ago, uh, I talked about Australian sparkling and um, uh, one of the brewers down in Melbourne had actually brewed three different versions of the beer and we put it to the informal vote of the people that were there, which ones they liked. And they were all similar. So you, you have a, uh, a highly effervescent, uh, quite an earthy, uh, tone to the hopping. It's reasonably alcoholic for a for a drinking beer. So five point nine. I know, I know in the in the states that that would be considered a session ale, but it's not. <laughs> it's it is it is not really sessionable. It does go down really well on a on a hot day. So it's got a malt backbone in there. Uh, historically, it used 30 percent sugar. Uh, today it's an all malt beer, uh, and today the signature hop that's used in it is Pride of Ringwood, uh, which gives that earthy, earthy flavour to it. So it's highly carbonated, very refreshing, and for people that might be uh, uh, members of the AHA, uh, I did a talk in Minneapolis a few years ago about Australian sparkling and delved into it in a lot more lot more detail. And you should be able to get that 
uh, in the Homebrew Con archive, if you remember. Yeah, the, the Homebrew Con archive, if you go over to the AHA website and you remember, you can have access to all of the 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 presentations that are given at Homebrew, Homebrew Con. They video them and they put them on the archive and you can watch them and it's, it's really cool. And uh, the fact that you were in Minneapolis a few years ago, if we want to dive a bit deeper into that style, we could definitely look that up. And also, when you talk about uh, six o'clock brews and bronze brews, are are there recipes in those books or do you mainly just dive into the history? Uh, No, there's um, uh, the whole thing about them was to get and to compensate for the uh, the the works of history about a brewery and the beers is to actually get to grips with what the beers could have tasted like and and try and get them to uh, uh, as accurate a, a representation uh, as I could. And a lot of my um, a lot of my mates in the extra special uh, Brewers Club, which is local here in Sydney, uh, I put the hard word on them and they brewed a lot of the recipes. So I think there's 50 odd recipes in in bronze brews. There's uh, another umpteen recipes, and because a lot of them are similar, I'm not saying that every every beer uh, in the book was brewed, but we I think we brewed enough of the beers for me to feel comfortable that if you if you take the recipe, you should get something that's a drinkable beer. Uh, there were a few um, uh, mistakes in translation. I uh, I miscalculated some salt additions on one particular beer, and I wasn't really intending to make a go of it, but uh, that's what ended up. Anyway, <laughs> uh, that's why you do some trial beers just to make sure that that you've you've got it about right. And, and so is home brewing, right there. We, we, we is the trial and error till you get it right. <laughs> yeah, I, and um, but again, I I wanted to make sure that that what um, uh, what I was putting in the book would would lead to a decent beer. And uh, feedback I've had over the years is a lot of people have brewed the beers. Uh, I'm not sure that many of them have actually brewed it to the recipe that's in the book. That's another story, perhaps. Uh, but. Um, uh, a lot of people seem to have been happy to uh, try and recreate some uh, some beers, and that's good. Awesome. And and let's dive a bit into your newer book, uh, Guile Brews. Uh, the, you've abandoned Australia for this one and, and dove into uh, some European ales. So wh- why don't we dive into uh, w- what's covered in that book? Well, it's it's... It's all interrelated, really, because uh, so much of the Australian brewing industry was influenced by uh, the UK, and I'll, I'll use the I'll use the UK as being all the bits except Ireland, um, which is a separate country. At the time, again, you've got to timestamp these things. In the beginning of the 20th century, it was all one place. So Britain, it was Britain and Ireland. Uh, Ireland was ruled by um, uh, by England, London in particular, uh, and that all developed through the early part of the 20th century and leading to a separate Ireland. So it, where I say UK, the brewing traditions in Australia were mainly, not exclusively, but mainly from people that came from from England in the in the 19th century which meant you've got um, infusion mashing uh, you've got various techniques but it also meant that as as Australia was a colony of England uh, the vast majority of the people here had actually come from England or Ireland and were drinking beers that they liked and there was an import market. So uh, beers like Bass Red Triangle Pale Ale was imported, uh, as was Guinness and, uh, and McEwan's and a, a whole lot of other famous um, breweries from the UK generally. So 
What I wanted to understand was how were the locals competing against the imports? Because the imports were very uh, different beers in my mind. And uh, that set me off looking through archives in the UK to be able to compare and contrast between uh, the response, if you like, of equal to best imported uh, from Australian brewers, well, what were they actually competing against? And I, I tried to find sufficient uh, comparison beers for both um, bronze brews and six o'clock brews. And then I ended up with literally gigabytes of photographs of, um, of other information from, from England and Cornwall and I wondered what I should do with it. And I thought, well, I'd still have in mind to do a third Australian book if I can find more original sources. But in the meantime, I thought I would capture for posterity what I'd found. So I'd, I'd gone through uh, Cornish beers. I grew up in Cornwall, and Cornwall is not part of England or the UK. It's a separate country. A lot of people don't understand that, but at least your listeners will understand that. Um, and the, the beers I, uh, I drank as a lad, uh, and I was very keen to try and find those beers, and I succeeded to a, a reasonably good extent. To get there, I, I went to various breweries, and then uh, probably 2017... I had the opportunity through work to to go to um, uh, the UK and I organised my trip such that uh, I would be in in London and I took a day trip up to um, uh, Stratford-upon-Avon and there is the uh, Shakespeare archive which contains lots of stuff about Shakespeare but it also contains the flowers brewery records uh, over a hundred years of records uh, again a hundred years of records enables you to see the shifts and and uh, development of, of different beers usually with the same names but actually a different beer I then was um, was quite happily uh, wandering around on Facebook and I saw one of my mates, uh, Richard Adamson of uh, Young Henry's Brewery in Sydney, was doing a collaboration brew at Banks Brewery in um, Wolverhampton. So I sent him a message, as you do, and I said, um, could you ask the brewer whether I could have a look at his archives? And after a bit of backwards and forwards, um, uh, in my trip to the UK in 2017, I went to Wolverhampton, took the tour, which I highly recommend, and um, and spent two days pho photographing the archives. For your listeners it, it, that don't know, um, Banks is um, uh, in the West Midlands, black country, very much the home of Mild Ale. So I was very keen to discover what I could what I could about Mild Ale, and then also on that trip. Because there's nothing like coordinating your work with your research activities. I went to Cork. Well, I actually went to um, Dublin first. Caught the bus. Went to Cork. That evening, drank some stout. Both Guinness, Beamish and uh, Murphy's. And then I spent the full day in the Cork University archives. Uh, photographing the Murphy's Brewing Records. Uh, and the archivists there were, were very helpful and everywhere I've been when I've explained what, I, what I'm trying to achieve, uh, the archivists have been uh, really, really good. And that gave me Irish stouts. It would have been nice to do Guinness, but on the other hand, a regional brewery like Murphy's, uh, it was accessible to me. It suited the timing, and um, they really have produced some interesting beers.
uh, if if you think that Irish stout, as currently defined in the BJCP guidelines, is is wonderful, well, perhaps you ought to try uh, an 1889 extra stout from Murphy's and just see how different that beer is because it is really different and uh, may or may not be to your taste but I think you should give it a crack <laughs> well let, let's dive into that a bit deeper if you were to be if you were talking about a beer that is different from the 1889 version to the 2020 version what kind of high level differences would you would you see like the quality of the grain the different types of hops they used what 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 would you say are the fundamental differences in those beers well the the murphy's beer uh they had their own maltings on site uh they were most of their barley was local to um the area so they were malting their own uh they weren't using any sugar uh, they they were using black malt, so black paint and malt, not roast malt. From from all the information I've uh, I've worked through, uh, and they were using a lot of black malt. Uh, from other references in the in the records that I found, uh, they seem to be buying pressed yeast from Guinness. So pressed yeast, um, just a waste product for Guinness. So I, th- I think something like uh, WLP 004, reputedly uh, an Irish, the Irish ale yeast, uh, is a good basis. Um, but no adjuncts. So uh, no flake barley, uh, no roast barley. Just very simple pale malt, black malt. Uh, and the proverbial lot of hops. Now, they were using uh, hops from California in some of the um, in some of their brews. Uh, I can't quite remember offhand uh, what went into um, the 1889 version, but there was a much higher hopping rate than a, a modern day, let's call it a, a, a Guinness dry stout. It's the 1889 is a dry stout, but it's a dry and bitter stout. And the uh, the use of black paint and malt gives it that slightly uh, dusty type um, uh, finish, along with the uh, the bitterness. It it does make for a nice pint. Um, but it is not at all like the uh, the four percent ABV. Oh, I'll just I'll just look it up a tick so at least we're getting the right information. The um, uh, I think it was about just 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 mull it over for yourself for a minute while I'm looking up the book. Yeah, no problem. Right, um, so it'll be M for Murphy's, wouldn't it? Yeah. The other thing in Murphy's, I managed to find in 1912, their complete product range. Here we go. Ah, so it's a, a 7.6 to 8% ABV. So it's a 1078 original gravity, finishing gravity, 1020. Wow, that that's not even in the same range of what a Murphy stout is today. Like right now it's probably what 4% alcohol and, and to kind of say, Hey, this is what a dry stout was is today in comparison to an, a seven or 8% beer from a hundred years ago is not even close. <laughs> That's right. And it, it's, um, uh, in my taste testing, this is draft beer. Uh, the, the differences between draft Guinness uh, Murphy's and Beamish is, was was very very subtle. I, I I felt that the the modern day Murphy's had a little bit of crystal sweetness in it, uh, 
but they were really, really close to each other. And they're, they're low alcohol beers, really. So uh, an extra stout from Murphy's in 1889, uh, Clusters, Fuggles, and Hallatau. So it, it, it is a, I've, I've brewed this one a couple of times. It's their version of extra stout there is probably just at the bottom end of a foreign export stout uh, or the top end of a double stout oh. uh, in modern style guidelines so yeah, yeah. And, I, and i'm actually surprised to see to see cluster listed there you know that's such always kind of driven as such a truly american hop so like for example if you make a a, a traditional style american cream ale you uh, traditionally it should have cluster in it right and so uh, I was really surprised to see a classic historic British or or really Irish stout with cluster hops in it. It just it, it kind of talks about like you know shipping was a thing then, and people were brewing at scale and uh, and they were using what they had. Um, it was a commodity market. Uh, they uh, in Australia they bought they bought things on price. Um, probably not too much on quality in, in some instances, but uh, hops from all over the world, both in Britain, Ireland, Australia. Uh, Halitau was an interesting choice. So they, they were buying, uh, they were buying Alpha. In effect, they weren't. They wouldn't have called it. They wouldn't have called it that then. Uh, but I've seen a lot. Of cluster used uh, in in Australia, uh, the hop growers uh, used golden cluster uh, in the early part of the twentieth century, probably for fifty odd years at least. Uh, and they, when when prohibition kicked in in the states, uh, there were all these hops that had no market, so they were really cheap. <laughs> uh, and and you can and. You, the protectionist barriers that the local hop growers, both in the UK and uh, in Australia, they wanted tariff barriers. Yeah, another thing that um, seems to crop up from time to time in history. Uh, they wanted tariffs to protect their industry uh, from these cheap imports. And really, the uh, what were the West Coast growers at that time in the States? Uh, they were dumping product because what else could they do with it? Nobody was using it in um, in the states uh, in that prohibition period. Yeah, and it, it's funny how economics still has a lot to even today has a lot to do with the the beer that ends up in your glass, right? Uh, for example, we 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 still struggle to get specific hops from australia i'll, I'll use a uh, galaxy for example just the cost of galaxy here in the states is really high it's a very sought after hop and obviously it's I, I think even a patented hop or it's not really a hop that you can you know grow here in the states and so it, it's funny how the economics of beer still have a lot to do with what ends up in your glass and and it's it was that case a hundred years ago it was that case 200 years ago and it's that case even today well, they, they're possibly even more so in the past where successive governments um, had price regulations. So the, the cost, of a, cost of a beer was regulated. So you, you had to be economic in your use of materials in, in brewing. And that includes the use of hops and, and making sure that you you still had to produce something that was a, a drinkable product, uh, but you you also had to bear in mind the economics, as you say. Yeah. Well, let, let's talk a bit about uh, your current uh, projects that you're working on. What, what's in the future for you? Are, are you you said you were still working on an, another book about history, Australian brewing history? Is that still in the works? Yes. Yes. I, I, I'm. Uh, because my wife won't listen to this, uh, I'm actually writing our family history, which has got nothing to do with brewing, of course. But every now and again, I need a break. So I, I do a little bit of um, adding to what I've got. So I've 
I've, I've bumped into a bit of a roadblock. I've, I don't have much from Queensland and I don't have much from Victoria in terms of primary records. I've, I've been to Carlton United Breweries. Uh, I've looked in their archive and unfortunately the sort of information that, that I would look for or I need to do recreations is simply not there. What I have picked up in my travels, I have some uh, uh, some historic beers from uh, New South Wales in the country areas, uh, and I have some interesting bits of history that are sort of developing. But I, I do need some more some more primary sources, some more production records, preferably from Queensland, uh, or and I know there's an archive in South Australia which. Uh, you have to have the permission of the plant manager to access that. And I asked a couple of years ago, and I was politely told no. Might have to ask again at some stage. So, yeah, I, I do need a bit more, um, a bit more content, but I do have the structure of um, of a third book on uh, Australia. Yeah. Uh, awesome. And, and what are you? Let's talk a bit about just your current home brewing what are what kind of beers are you into personally brewing right now well funnily enough uh because i've brewed so many recreations over the years i'm enjoying brewing something well several beers that aren't recreations uh i grow my own hops and uh we've just harvested the hops here i've got over three kilos of chinook hops and some, uh, uh, what else I have? Oh, some cluster hops. So a few different hops. And I've still got quite a lot of hops from previous years. So I've been, I've been brewing um, pale ales using my homegrown hops. Uh, so I like, a, I like a pale ale. I mean, we're still at the back end of summer here. Uh, so you, a, a nice quaffer, about 4%. Uh, good hop character not ipa hop character not fruit salad uh not murky things proper <laughs> beers you know with nice nice clear crisp beers uh, i've got i've recently bought a uh, firmzilla which enables you to um ferment under pressure and that's great for for transferring and i and i i feel as though it's giving a better flavour profile, not only from being able to do dry hopping uh, without oxygen getting into it, but also the uh, just the ease of transferring into the keg. Uh, and you can almost serve it direct from the uh, from the fermenter as a uh, as a real ale, uh, not artificially carbonated, and that's been really nice. Um, but yeah, the um, uh, this time of the year, it's it's real really pale ales for me. I'm, I'm considering doing a, a milk stout next. Uh, so I like my stouts. I like my pale ales. That's that's awesome. And I know that we we had a bit of a conversation before we started recording the show, and you you told me that you've had some pretty cool projects, at least on the technology side. Uh, you've built a brew pilus. Why, why don't we talk a bit about like what 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 you did to build a brew pilus, uh, and uh, and and you said you've built two of them, right? Yeah. Um, it's it. Look, I I probably need to say what my background is first, so that you get an appreciation. I'm I'm not a computer person, um, in terms of programming. So the the whole programming thing was a bit of a challenge. Uh, I'm, my history is more in application engineering, so I can understand uh, an electrical engineering and, and that sort of stuff. Uh, but that was a long time ago. Um, so I did my research. Uh, I found this thing called GitHub. Now, a lot of your listeners will go, oh, I know what GitHub was. I had no <laughs> idea what GitHub was. 
So I go there and there's all this stuff uh, that the practical considerations of somebody that does not, I, I know about flashing EPROMs, I understand the principles of doing that, actually trying to get it to work with Windows or Linux or whatever, uh, it, the hardware construction was easy. That's solder up the bits, uh, stick them on a breadboard, um, buy your bits from China in the first place, uh, all that, not really a drama in that bit, but the actually configuring the software. Now, I brew in the garage, which is a uh, zincaloom clad Faraday cage. So trying to get Wi-Fi signals out of the garage was a problem. So my, my son, who is um, uh, into IT support and such like, uh, suggested that I needed to extend the blue cable to the garage and then I put a, um, a repeat access point in and that got over my problems to a degree uh, and then I was finding it was hanging uh, everything was second hand so the, the modem was really old and uh, used as an access point so I, I did a a cludge or a bodge uh, I simply put a timer on that dropped the modem out every hour. So I dropped the power off the modem so it recycled every hour so that uh, if it hung, it would only hang for a while and I was and that worked fine. Uh, and then this year, uh, there's something in Australia called the NBN. This is a government owned monopoly that provides your um, internet and phone. Uh, service and their modems and uh, IP addresses and all the rest of it would not work with the setup that we had. Had a fairly complicated home network that worked just fine. So the second one I built, I used the um, no DM, DEMU, whatever it's called, uh, 16 Pro with the external. Um, Wi-Fi uh, aerial. Now, touch wood, it's working in the garage and I can actually see that uh, very easily now when I'm on the uh, home network. And of course, with uh, Brewfather, which is great, uh, I can get all that going, reporting straight in to my batch and see that where wherever I am. I'm long-term user of Promash, which uh, a lot of people would go, what's that? Well, in 2003, it was the, absolutely the bee's knees of, um, of brewing software. Uh, all my uh, recreation recipes were derived using that. Uh, and then I bit the bullet last year and moved to Brewfather, imported all my uh, recipes in using XML and then cross check them all using Brewfather. And uh, Thomas is a great guy. He's uh, actively uh, developing the product and uh, I found it really, really good. I know it's on your site as a supporter, but uh, uh, I just found the whole the whole experience uh, so much uh, so much the better because of his involvement, I think. Yeah, he's he's a really great programmer. His support's amazing, and and not because he's a supporter of my web of, of my my show. I've actually I used Brewfather well before I got into podcasting, and it it was one of those things that when I pulled up the web app the first time on my laptop, I was like, somebody actually gets how brewing software should work. It should be this easy. And uh, mm. it's it, you know the the water calculations you just hit the button and they work it's amazing, and then tweak them a little like I I don't I don't know just I I can't tell you how big of a fan of Brewfather I am I love it it's mm. my favorite software and uh, if you go over to my website and hit the banner uh, there's my plug uh, Brewfather knows we sent you and they support the show so please do that well uh, and, yeah and and in in the um, if you go in the uh, library. 
and you type in 1930, you will find a recipe that I've shared for a, a 1930 uh, gold nail from, uh, from the UK, which again didn't fit in the book, but uh, it, it, um, it's there for anybody to have a look at if they want to get an idea of that gold nails aren't a new thing either. No, they're not. But, you know, still, a 1930 version is going to be very different than a 2020 version, right? It's it's quite close. If, if you apply the style, when I banged it into the into Brewfather, I was surprised how close it was to the style guide for or the 20, uh, 2015 style guidance for, uh, for a gold nail. So, anyway. Yeah, so uh, we'll we'll definitely make sure that we have uh, all of your information on the show notes. So please, if you're listening to the show and you want to dive a bit more into uh, Peter's books, just look in here. I'll have links right to his web store, and also I'll have links to his website. He has a, a portion of his book in there that you can read, so you can kind of get an idea of how his book's laid out. And... Uh, I, I just want to say, Peter, thank you so much for coming on the show. It was a really great conversation, and I, I feel like I learned a ton, and and I feel like our our listeners will. Uh, so thank you very much for coming on to Homebrew DIY. No worries. Thanks very much for having me. I'd really like to thank Peter for coming on today's show. It was a fascinating conversation and I personally learned a lot. I'm also going to link to his website in the show notes as well as to his Facebook page and I'll list the recipe we talked about earlier in the show uh, right here in the show notes. So just keep an eye out for that. Well, that's it for this week and we'll see you next week on Homebrewing DIY.